Let's get the view now, looking at the opinion pages of today's newspapers. And Archie Brown, the author of The Myth of Strong Leadership, is sticking to his guns. He writes in The Guardian that the idea of a strong party leader may be popular, but it's unnecessary for electoral success and damages our democracy. Daniel Finkelstein, the Conservative peer Lord Finkelstein, thinks this election may come to be seen as the beginning of a realignment of politics. Writing in the Times, he says we are yet to discover how big this change will be as the Conservatives and Labour each seek voters away from their traditional bases. Steve Bell accuses Theresa May of hypocrisy in this cartoon, which I've says turned some stomachs in our production staff. Uh, we've got the uh, <laughs> uh, pr Prime Minister says that Jeremy Corbyn would find himself alone and naked negotiating with the EU, but it's Mrs May and her three Brexiteers who Steve Bell has marching naked off the edge of a cliff. And Jeremy Corbyn is the target of Peter Brooks' cartoon in The Times, uh, the Labour leader Diane Abbott and Blue Bar and he, our blue people presenters, holding up uh, lavatory rolls with sticky tape, interview cock-ups uh, that they've uh, pulled off in their radio interviews. And Blue Peter also features in Blower's cartoon in The Telegraph, everyone betraying their age, uh, following the death of the show's former presenter, John Noakes. Here, Jeremy Corbyn and his team are asking children to send in their milk bottle tops in an appeal to fund Labour's promises with the target being free everything. Well, with me to go through those pages is Mark Wallace, the executive editor of Conservative Home, and Aisha Azarika, former advisor to Ed Miliband and a stand-up comedian. Welcome uh, to you both. Now, what about this myth of the strong leader? Are you buying this one, Mark Wallace? I buy it to a certain extent. We all like to talk about the election as if it's a presidential process. And you, know, you see talk, saw Theresa May saying, vote for me and my team. Um, although she seems to be emphasising the party a little bit more now after uh, her manifesto problems. But the simple fact is you do need a good figurehead and a clear direction at the top, but you can't do everything yourself. The state is simply too big nowadays. What do you think? I'd absolutely agree with that. I mean, look, you want to have a strong, charismatic leader that has some sort of natural uh, authority, but, you know, no man or a woman is an island, particularly at Downing Street. You know, you need to have um, actually quite good management skills in terms of supporting your team, leading your team, but making sure that you're bringing them with you. So I have some sort of sympathy with this. I thought it was interesting um, in the debates on Monday night when Paxman said to Corbyn, you know, but, but you didn't get lots of your ideas in the manifesto. And he said, well, actually, our manifesto is a process. Like, we sort of write it through agreement. And I think that's not a bad thing. You know, you shouldn't have a dictator or, or that kind of very, you know, the cult of the leader can be quite a dangerous thing in politics. And it, it was really the leader and the leadership team who got the Conservatives in the mess of their manifesto, not consulting as far as we understand. It was. And obviously everybody at this point is now spinning out exactly whose fault it was or whose fault it wasn't. So we should take everything with, with a pinch of salt. But it's fair to say there were concerns from the outset that the model that Theresa May used to run the Home Office was one she was trying to transpose of a very tight team into Downing Street. And running a whole government is a very different thing. And yet, when you do the analysis, more people know who the party leaders are than they do the names of the candidates in their own uh, area. And all the evidence suggests that leader is probably the single biggest factor in uh, who people vote for. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, ultimately, um, most normal people do not spend their time, you know, thinking about politics. They're getting on with their daily life. So a very small kind of bit cuts through. So the, the leader does carry a huge amount of weight for the, for the party. But one of the things I think that really does need to be done, particularly in the Labour Party, but also I would say in the Conservative Party, is you know, good management should not just be something that applies to business, it should absolutely apply to the top of a political party as well. And that means bringing on, nurturing and actually like letting some of your other talent out there. At the moment, you'd be hard pressed to find, I think, both people knowing who were other players in the, cons in the cabinet, apart from people like Boris Johnson and definitely in Labour's shadow cabinet as well. Well, I think the shadow cabinet is part of the problem here for Labour because if, you, if they were to judge that Jeremy Corbyn had some challenges as a leader, they would then have to look at the wider team. But we know that Diane Abbott seems to have some maths problems. We know that Emily, Emily Thornberry... Well, I've got two words that. for you, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson. <laughs> Emily Thornberry, his shadow, his shadow as Foreign Secretary, just said uh, in the last couple of days <laughs> that we can't export food to Australia because it'll go off. She I hasn't know, heard of fridges. Not as much I mean, this is a She's not as much comedy gold as Boris Johnson. Comedy gold or incompetence. <laughs> There's the difference. Now, what about Daniel Finkelstein? I mean, it, it, 
did strike me this is a very interesting article. I mean, basically, he's saying that we're seeing the parties shift away from their bases, that we've got the Tory party saying government is on your side, aiming for uh, less well-off people, uh, people in the north who, who might have voted for Brexit, whereas we've got the Labour Party becoming, if you like, the party of Islington, appealing to uh, over-educated people and uh, university professors and, 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 and the rest of it. Is this a fair analysis, do you think? I think there is some truth in it. There's a lot of, I think, political sort of cross-dressing going on in this election. And I think there will be, I think, afterwards quite a, a realignment of people's values. I think one of the things that's been really interesting, particularly, I think we started seeing it with the referendum in, in Scotland, and it's been a, a sort of process, particularly with the second referendum on, on leaving the EU, we had kind of <coughs> taboos broken. We had families and people who always voted for a particular party, and then they crossed the line and voted for somebody else. And so, so no, I think when you taste voting for somebody else, it sort of breaks that tradition of, I've always stuck for, for this party. So I think people are trying on other parties for size, looking at things. Some people are very, you know, uh, Brexit focused. Other people, you know, have, have got other issues. So I think there is going to be quite an interesting realignment of values after this election. Absolutely. And you know, it's definitely the case that tribal loyalties, the, the, the feeling that several generations of your family have always voted one way or the other, they are powerful, they're very strong, but they're also very brittle. And once you have to take that plunge, as a lot of Leave voters did in the referendum, for example, of ignoring the party you're traditionally loyal to, feeling that they're wrong, differing with them on it, and particularly in the aftermath when you get called an ignorant racist for doing it, that makes a big difference. In the North East, where I'm from, um, if you look through, say, when the Tories won the Tees Valley mayoralty, you're talking about seats like Bishop Auckland in County Durham, talking about even Sedgefield, perhaps, yeah. Tony Blair's ex seat, where Tory campuses are going to places they haven't been yeah. for years and getting a warm reception. I mean, I should, if you look at it, you know, in terms of raw votes, it would appear that the group that if you buy Danny Finkelstein's argument that the Conservatives are appealing to, rightly or wrongly, is just bigger than the group that Jeremy Corbyn's appealing to. Well, I, look, we'll have to see how the, 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 the election sort of shakes down. But I definitely think in the aftermath of all of this, Labour, I mean, I thought it was interesting, Katrina's May initial strategy, which may well prove to be quite successful, was to say to make a broad offer to UKIP voters and no. say, come home to the Conservatives. Okay. The Labour Party may need to think about doing that, not to you. OK, to well, let's uh, have a look at the former Deputy Prime Minister. That is Nick Clegg. Uh, he no, is the, arriving the uh, for a Liberal Democrat event in central London. Uh, he's surrounded by school children. Uh, this is because <laughs> we uh, know that the Liberal Democrats are going to concentrate on the co Conservative proposal to reverse the coalition policy of free school meals. Uh, that is what Nick Clegg says you can get for uh, 7p, the amount he says the Conservatives will spend on these breakfasts. The Conservative plans for a dementia tax is being raised a lot. But the thing that keeps coming up over and over again, particularly amongst families with small children in primary school, is the anger that many mums and dads feel about the announcement of Theresa May. Well, Nick Clegg there making uh, the case for the uh, coalition policy. I mean, I, I, Mark Wilson, I'm just interested. Why do you think they bothered to uh, make this uh, U turn in the manifesto of the Tories? It doesn't seem obviously a particularly popular policy. Well, I think to a certain extent there's a distinction between David Cameron as Conservative leader and Theresa May as Conservative leader. Cameron uh, was often quite tempted yeah. by, these, yeah. by, by, by these kind well, of. So, so, um, so <coughs> 250,000 school children lose their lunches uh, so that we can show that Theresa May is different from David Cameron? No, no I don't need to show that. I, th I think it's a product of the fact that she looked at that policy and thought, I think perfectly reasonably, that Nick Clegg deciding that well off kids should get free meals was less important than her thinking that poorer kids should get more. As it, one other thing on this particular topic, can we say to all parties, please stop getting kids to hold placards? Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, I don't care who it is. It, it just seems really distasteful to me. All right, we will uh, pause uh, at that moment. This is All Out Politics.